Well, thanks everyone for coming. It's great to see some of you here again um, after yesterday. Uh, um, uh, I should say, um, in response to, to Chika's introduction, that um, this is probably less of a scholarly talk, um, more of an informal uh, set of notes that are have been accreting for some time, um, and I am preparing to append uh, the material that I'll preview this afternoon to my uh, forthcoming volume of, of poems called Music for Porn uh, that Nightboat Books will publish this fall. Um, so um, while there may be some gestures toward the scholarly, I, I like to think of this more as a, a, very, a very hybrid, um, kind of cross-genre um, set of sustained and not so sustained reflections that draw on a range of, of forms and genres, say there's a bit of polemic and po poetic statement, uh, lyrical essay, and, um, but it's also just a set of, of aphorisms, perhaps. Um, so that's, uh, I, I thought to give you a sense of where I'm going uh, with respect to my thinking about the project, to share a few poems from the project first that, um, uh, that I hope uh, will give you a, a sense. I've chosen a few pieces that seem to be on the, um, the extreme end of some of the things that I'll be talking about. So. Um, it's not, not exactly a, a, a representative set of poems, but rather poems that I think um, will animate for you some of the problems and questions and stakes of the book. So I'll read a few of these and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll launch into, the, uh, into, into the, the essay, if you will. And I'd like to keep this porous, if possible. I mean, the set, of, the set of notes from which I'm working are themselves very porous um, and allow for um, uh, a confluence of, of thinking. So um, I'm hoping we can do that, that together. So this, this first piece is, is a very short one, and um, it's, it's called This Organ Opens One to Structure. The situation's pretty unstable, said my soldier with no hands, and I imagine his prosthetic up my ass. I love the feeling, I even quiver with the pleasure of being so near the goal. Now that we've caressed the soldier, I can finally touch myself again, begging to be called the names he used to call himself when the nation loved his bloodstool, eating it and fucking them, singing, is it in yet? Yes, yes, you can do it in the barest light of reason where cruel names find proper realization and what you wear is how they eat little over there where the land is one with its things and peoples don't make me your fall guy, he said. I am you when it's dark. Our own failure to happen is the only event worth noting phases, sucking off a self-defining absence of content. Can't you see I'm already my own worst formalism, all the marrow sucked out of everything? Lick your own wounds, it said, as if the words would make me one with the current traumatic neuroses of peace. That's how we live on waste, he said, crawling out under the dead weight a carcass had come, rising when he saw me on my knees, his dick in my mouth, creaming him crushed beneath the weight of nations, lost thinking, what will this joy do to my tongue? How will I call things back? Now this is sadness, 
my friend Bob called it, the unbearable sorrow of having no future in the present. And though he had something else in mind, I'm thinking about what he said now. I have some others, but um, we'll wait and see if they're necessary. Okay. So, um, over lunch, I took a few notes uh, to, to preface this. You know, reflecting on what I've, what, what I'm hoping to accomplish in. Uh, in this postscript and realizing um, how this set of notes in part is organized around a, a, a ruse or an artifice of sorts, by which I mean the soldier about which I'm going to speak as if he were present from Music for Porn's uh, inception is actually something of a back formation, right? by which I mean that I've been working on these poems really ever since I completed my first book, uh, Rumored Place, about six, five, six years ago. So these poems have been emerging for some time, and they seemed to be seeking a thought form or a shape or a figure that might adequately allegorize the irreconcilability of, of private and public desires with the so-called experience of personal life and the impersonal discourses and images that mediate one's most intimate relation to one's body and, and others. Um, the soldier only emerged midway in this project. Um, and then the poems began to reorganize themselves and reconceptualize themselves, resense themselves around that figure. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I, I think of the work as a, a project that's been struggling to theorize its own conditions of possibility, um, almost like a sensory organ in the process of theorizing itself. I, I really love, I love that figure from Marx's early economic and philosophical manuscripts where he's talking about the mode of production and the senses in relation to that mode of production and how the senses are always in the process of theorizing uh, their own ability to sense in advance of cognition. And I like, um, I like thinking about the project in that way. Um, and my presentation here is very much a part of that process. Um, so this begins with some notes on affection and war with an epigraph from uh, Emily Dickinson. A soldier's balls, who asketh more, must seek the neighboring life. I can't mark the moment when the militarization of common sense penetrated my rhythms. Perhaps what I ought to say is that I can't mark the moment when I became aware of this. Can I really be aware of this even now? What would such awareness mean? What does the militarization of common sense feel like, unavailable to immediate sensation despite having penetrated all my senses? Can a poem sense the shape of so supersensible a thing? Lyrics non sight a place we don't see but which haunts everything we do see, may be a military base base of a soldier's balls, his wound, this void in perception, what's become of the commons. I don't know how to sing this, but I don't know how not to sing this either. Walt Whitman offers a troubling model for singing what I cannot not sing, and music for porn takes Whitman's Civil War poems together with the affects they stimulate as a point of departure longing, shame, fear, tenderness, tenderness, rage, sorrow. Affections shall solve the problems of freedom yet, Whitman writes in Over the Carnage, rose prophetic a voice. But the affections Whitman arouses in drum taps require a battlefield for their full expression, a site where one's tenderness for a fallen soldier, my comrade I wrapped in his blanket, enveloped well his form, etc., may be the most powerful affection of all. Affections shall solve the problem of freedom yet. 
to organize prosodically an experience of the war. Whitman links so many uncoded affects, say a certain unspeakable tenderness for a dead soldier's body. I bend down and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin. Linking these to overcoded feelings, love of nation, fervor for democracy, a patriotism whereby our desire to feel gets contracted to a nation whose frame of reference those same feelings could threaten to overwhelm or break down. Whitman arouses so many intimacies, seemingly raw at first, unbound to any proper social knowledge, and organizes them in his democratic vista, mythic future of my country, extension of a mangled present. His open form of feeling in the Civil War verses organizes an emergent sound, the hum and buzz of the great shells, echolocating inchoate sensations whose otherwise inarticulate feelings, fear, shame, sorrow, tenderness, rage, the poems go on to marshal as purposeful emotion. If prosody is organized stress, a technology for making meaning out of rhythm and sound, then Whitman is a masterful technician. His prosodic audition organizes the enclosure and containment of the hum and the buzz in barracks, trench, hospital, field, a sound that could, if untuned and unleashed, check the militarization that makes it audible. What might that untuning sound like? Homoerotic comradeship, partisan and militant, becomes fraternal mourning, unaligned, and disarmed as soon as comrade becomes soldier. But the politics of Whitman's prosodic desire for a post-war democracy is contradictory, like our own, and quietly harbors the body of militarized sense at once ahistorical, prescribing amnesia, and metaphysical, requiring a sacrifice, a body that disappears as living flesh as soon as it becomes the scene of national reconciliation. In order to function as sacrificial corpus, the soldier's corpse must be drained of its historicity, just as the nation's mourning must be evacuated of any trace of partisan, militant subjectivity. This is how my love goes bad in the body of a soldier. Whitman performs the affective tuning of a military figure, a figure perhaps only, real, only fully realized in our own present. It has naturalized my ears, so I can't hear the noise any longer, a silence we might now call completed sound, converging with its own suppression. How might this sound sound from the horizon, impossible, of a demilitarized world? From there, what will we have heard here? The poems of drum taps make our implication in the production, the love, of these, our, militarized bodies palpable. Arousing intimate sensations, the poems also yoke the feelings they stimulate to contrary ends, channeling one's affections while coding, redeeming, our relation to carnage. It is at this redemption that my poems rage. The nation's ends, unending war, can make my feelings socially useful even before they can be improperly felt. Fear, shame, sorrow, and rage, these affects are public and historical the medium through which our emotions circulate, and they could pervert the violence they otherwise lubricate. But when perceived as private, intimate, personal, they are silently made to serve a grotesque war economy. How might a poem service this perversion? Music for Porn aims to activate some of these common affections, fear, shame, lust, tenderness, rage, 
sorrow, before they become harnessed to a situation of unending war. But while the poems frustrate Whitman's desire, democracy, by betraying its perversity, the poems themselves become ever more frustrated and perverted in the process, distorted, turned away from their original aims insofar as their own utopian longings are blocked by current conditions whereby a demilitarized world is impossible to perceive or imagine. My soldier allegorizes and embodies this obstruction, his hard muscle being what's in the way. So I locate the writing in the cleavages and faults where desire, the body, collides with these conditions and where the poems become sensory organs in the process of perceiving their own conundrum. As for Whitman, the affections unleashed on the battlefield are the materials for a kind of social alchemy whose transcendent yield would be nothing less than freedom itself. But Whitman's vision of a post-Civil War restored America, free and democratic, requires a sacrificial body, a very particular fallen body, my homo national, whose eros silently fills the hushed space between my organs, lost in unheard war noise. What might a poem sound like as it struggles to make audible the sound of passing into some as yet unimagined form of social being? What might it feel like to sense this passage in a poem that also registers the blocks and obstructions in precisely that utopian longing? I want to situate the poem on the threshold of intelligibility where these sensations are just becoming perceptible. A bleeding guy in uniform, wounded boy in an Afghan village, fallen guarantor of America's future. The body required by dominant visions of freedom and democracy is a dead one. Note the nimbus around the withdrawn corpse, castrated function of pure exchange an aneurysm in the present, a clot of volatile affects wrested from the pathos his body inspires in me even now. What feelings does his body conduct and organize? Is it too late to undo the usefulness of these emotions, to abject them by stimulating their unmastered remains, emotive waste of a carnage that ought to be finished but is still beginning again and again and again. Is it reasonable to think that a poem can do this? Music for Porn wants to reactivate Whitman's homoerotic affections in order to detour them from their martial ends, delink them from the future of this democracy. And yet, whatever organs wherein these affects are stimulated and trapped already bear the scars of the other future they block. Will we ever hear that clot rupture in a poem struggling to adapt in advance to the conditions of a world we failed to make? Um, that's the first part. The second part uh, is titled Funeral Rites and, uh, and engages with uh, Jean Genet, uh, the epigraph from Funeral Rites. In the midst of that suffering, it seemed to me, when shame had burned me through and through, that there remained amidst the flames, or rather the fumes of shame, a kind of imperishable diamond with a sharp, clear line. Such hazy arrows hovers around the military man, and it clings to my skin like a film of cash, residue of everyday domestic fantasies and all our quietly militarized rhythms. I can't wash myself of it, and my poems have lost that apotropaic potential to deflect his image, to keep it from usurping my own whenever I gaze in the mirror. 
What might it sound like were I able to subtract my longing from the wars to which it has been unwittingly contracted? I can't hear this sound. I can't make this sound. I need to hear this sound. I need to make this sound. Music for porn may be the record of all the distortions, frustrations, and amplifications that fall out in the effort to lend a sound figure to this inaudibility. Genet offers a very different model for rendering these affections, and it's devastating, exhilarating, as it blocks redemption at every turn. Working through the death of his lover, a resistance fighter in World War II, almost a century after Whitman, the narrator of funeral rites writes, my pain was so great that it sought escape in the form of fiery gestures, kissing a lock of hair, weeping on a breast, pressing an image, hugging a neck, tearing out grass, lying down on the spot and falling asleep in the shade, sun, or rain with my head on my bent arm. Like, like that, right? What gesture should I make? What sign would be left me? That's the end of the, the quote. The extremity of loss seeks repose in the seemingly familiar movements of a body. Is it kitsch? Is it melodramatic? Where meaning always concentrates in excess of the social structures that would make those movements intelligible. Somewhere in the flames and fumes of shame, something remains imperishable, a sharp, clear line that finds expression in a body's gesture, or a line of verse. For Genet, gestures appear to be unlike signs. Gestures remain paradoxically unbound to any codified knowledge while offering provisional containers for meaning's intractable surplus, last refuge of some, re last refuge of some fugitive experience in the process of organizing itself. No one bodily gesture will ever be sufficient, but each offers an ephemeral choreography. The death of the narrator's lover, Jean, a resistance fighter on the barricades defending Paris at the end of the war, is a death whose meanings, national, political, social, swarm in excess of any one story. And Genet's narrative aims to make those meanings unavailable for any use beside his own disfigured grief. The nation, however, has corralled those meanings for national ends, quoting, a young patriot fell here. Noble Parisians, leave a flower and observe a moment of silence, reads a sheet of lined notepaper pinned to the bark of a tree. If these sanctioned meanings, soldier lover as hero, are communicated by way of social signs, Genet will refuse them. What sign would be left me, he writes, opting instead for a set of generic gestures which exceed to a kind of perverse commonality by way of the singularity of this one body performing them. No sign may be left him, but his gestures acquire an intensity replete with possibility, autogestation, as they provisionally still the excess of the body's shape and social space, kissing a lock of hair, tearing out grass, while appearing to contain a set of feelings whose generic contours defy the harness that would bind the body to socially useful ends. What to do, what gesture, Janae writes, I withdrew from the drama as far as possible. So he withdraws then, but only to stage his own dramatic performance. The stylization of the body's poses creates a series of theatrical gestures, each of which works apotropaically, like a screen or a veil, to deflect precisely the meanings it appears most to resemble, like a mirror behind which an excess of meaning withdraws and becomes unavailable, inaccessible. <clears throat> At the same time, the narrator makes use of those signs, soldier, hero, criminal, but only to undo them 
reassigning their, their significance in a phantasmatic narrative where soldiers and lovers find a common denominator, not in the social values for which they fight, but rather perversely in the degree to which those bodies become available, visible targets for public shaming beyond the limits of consensual sympathy. <laughs> Genet goes on to activate the eros of this shame as a form of mortification, a sociality, in a wartime environment of complicity and contagious collaboration. Shame corrodes the illusion of individual agency and disables the juridical logic of guilt. Shame for Genet conducts a range of ambivalent affects simultaneously exposed to and detached from dominant apparatuses of meaning making. By way of this amplified activation of shame, the body betrays the nation, incarnating instead a site of resistance, an occlusion in complicit communication, a refusal of state interests. So there are my two foils. Um, and I'll just go on to, uh, I'll read a few more passages from the subsequent section, um, and then we can open it up. Uh, this is called Against Immunity. The epigraph is uh, from Eleni Stakopoulos. When I cannot distinguish my own cells from those about to be woken. I want to take seriously the maxim from Spinoza's ethics that we still don't know what a body can do. The body, solely from the laws of its own nature, can do many things at which its mind is amazed. But Spinoza's proposition can only be rehearsed as a useless diversion, an apology, if it's not guided by the realization that we do know what has been done to bodies, what is being done to them now. The hard bodies of all these soldiers at war bear the imprint of my consent, if only because my dissenting voice has done nothing to stop those wars. This inspires my rage, my lust, my shame, so many feelings coursing through a national agenda that will accommodate my feelings, if only as part of a national effort to further consolidate the meanings of those other others forever excluded, terrorist, criminal, immigrant, the project of U.S. exceptionalism, immunity, yields a kind of hyperinvestment in the normal within U.S. borders, an investment whose affective demands can accommodate the straight needs of gays and lesbians, say marriage, so long as they stick to a pluralist civil rights-based narrative of inclusion that hews to the norms of private life and identity. All my queer affections, like those aroused in Whitman's poems, used like sap like come to further bind our national interests, even as I refuse them. Empire needs virile young soldiers, materialized remains of our body in common, who are fundamentally dispensable, limit of a social or order, horizon of exchange. The body at war, my soldier, extension of these affections, open to risk without tenderness, penetration without pleasure, the body is purest meat, the nation's consensual pulse. The whole a weapon makes, where so many global processes, accumulation by dispossession, interminable war, environmental degradation, collide with the body's intimate recesses, all my desires and repulsions. Traces of my living labor die in such bodies, absorbed in that flesh, where love congeals and hardens with the muscle, convergence of corpus and finance. Or the I, first person singular, congeals and hardens, as in, quoting uh, a poem from music, music for Porn, my cock hardens in a soldier's wound. This line might be music for Porn's asymptotic limit, a figural horizon, a totally over-the-top impossibility, obsessive, ridiculous, perverse, which shapes a gesture, limbs an imaginary sight that may coincide with something real, where all the affects and feelings resonant in penetration congregate, awaiting transfiguration. Bullet hole, foxhole, asshole, openings through which our common product enters and exits, 
and where Whitman contracts his sweet affections to an empire's emergence. Without imposing any false identification or superimposition of incommensurate wholes, I'm compelled by the thread that moves through them, my poem's line. I'll just uh, skip to a few passages at the very end. Whatever these feelings, I want them to exceed my frame and arrive at a large and public intimacy. Common sense in its current social disembodiment has become a kind of, a kind of porn, expropriation of my most intimate relations, just as porn has become a kind of metaphysics. Like metaphysics, one must speak in it even as one speaks against it. Does this help explain my poem's frustrated and obsessive arousal to overturn common sense from within common sense itself? What might it sound like to sing so that song might unbind some of these frustrated energies to activate Whitman's eros against the militarized common sense that has contracted it? And yet, Music for porn may be nothing more than a placeholder, a stand-in or dummy for that reparation, a music suspended, stalled in false accompaniment as it struggles against the conditions that make the poems possible while failing, always failing, to unbind its own arrows from the din of contradictions that make them audible. or whatever of, um, of po poetic projects that are innovative, uh, prefacing their uh, work with a kind of um, introductory kinds of notes of the sort that you're ending with to the end. And it seems to me like that that, has, that decision says a lot to put mm -hmm. the, your commentary at the end of the project mm -hmm. rather than the, in the preparatory relation to what comes. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the phrase back formation that you uh, used in talking about the construction or the emergence of the soldier figure within the sequence uh, you know, also, also seems to speak to that impulse to follow the poetry with what almost at times resembles exegesis. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you can talk a little more about the, that particular decision yeah. as it relates to the, the concerns of the Poetry yeah. itself. Sure. Uh, why after? Why not before? Well, why I mean, I th even poetry? even to extend and, and and amplify the question and render it um, even more critical, like why append a set of notes at all, be it as preface or postscript, and that's a great question. I mean, um, and something I'd love to. Hear. I mean, I have I have many half baked thoughts about that, but uh, I'd love to hear what what people might think about the decision to include a set of such notes at all, especially if they do begin to resemble a kind of exegesis. Are you um, uh, imposing, you know, uh, an incredible burden on the, on the poems? Um, is that 
something that is uh, welcome? I mean, do readers welcome that? Do we welcome that? I, um, I'm modeling this, for those of you who are familiar with Disaster Suites, there's a postscript that concludes that volume. And um, I, I, I actually feel as though that postscript um, completes the book in a really, in a critical way. Um, I can't imagine the book without the postscript. But I'm, I manage to, what I believe I managed to achieve in that postscript is, um, I don't feel like I've managed to achieve the same thing here, right? It's, it's much more the, the, the lyricism of that postscript uh, um, maintains a much more nimble balance, um, to my ear at least, that it's, it's very conscientious of itself as a poem, right? That's, that's doing the work of a kind of, of, a kind of essay Right, taking a stab or, or, or an attempt or a try to, to complement what preceded it, reflecting on it. Um, these, these notes have become perhaps unwieldy. Um, you know, I, I may be moving toward a place where I have to throw up my hands and say, I don't know what to do with these. Should these be a part of the volume? Um, I feel that something needs to be part of the volume, uh, some set of reflections. Um, and I'm hoping this is moving toward that. <laughs> but I wonder if, it, I wonder if uh, it can be usefully viewed in terms, in light of shame, the kind of poet, poetics of shame that, that you're invested in. And so there, there seems like the, the growing shame that sort of begins to surface as the sequence progresses from what I know of it and what you've said today. Um, does shame, does, does, is the shame intensified by the postscript and is it channeled and directed, you know, um, in terms of collective shame, mm -hmm. you know, um, American foreign policy, or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, personal, private forms of shame? Or, mm -hmm. so it seems like that may be one guide to how to manage the, uh, the postscript to explain. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's shame management that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hear. What was it, when you were when you were accounting for the for the postscript to disaster suites? You said you achieved some kind of balance there. But I was curious about the balance. I th yeah, more um, in terms of um, I th I feel like I found an adequate form. I found an adequate like a, a genre of sorts, right? To to do the work that I was trying to trying to do. Um, that's that's all I meant, and um, and my concern here is that this may be an entirely inadequate form, and it's doing something beyond what I would like, ideally, for a postscript to do. Right, right. That it becomes it's it's uh, I'm beginning to codify too much. There's too much in the way of attempting a reading or channeling a reading of the work. Um, uh, Rather than reflecting on the conditions of its emergence, which is what I would like to do in a more in a more sustained and yet porous lyrical manner. Right. Oh well, um, I have a question, uh, but I, I just to, but before I'm friendly, I'll, I'll, I'll you know I'll follow up with you were saying before, which is that I, I actually do think look there's a long tradition of I was just thinking a lot about how like in the middle of Ben Franklin's autobiography he wrote he there's some letters that say, Dear Ben Franklin, please write your autobiography, you know? <laughs> and, and, and that, the, you know, that what you're doing is in the tradition of the Whitmanian preface, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, and it is, let's face it, for pleasure. I mean, you are doing a reading of, you can't not be doing a reading of your work. And of course. To go to what Chico was saying, you know, what you said yesterday, this beautiful line, shame is nothing but this demand to appear. And in a certain sense, what you're saying is, I failed, my poems are trying to unbind my attachment to the state form. And I can't do it mm -hmm. because I have I am so bound to a heroically wounded body that a body that has become general by virtue of its appearance for the state. You know that's that's what you. I'm I'm slightly paraphrasing what mm -hmm. you said, but that's kind of what you said, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, you're writing the first review of your book, and this is this is really true here much more <laughs> than yesterday. I thought mm -hmm. in your in your prose things, and I think mm -hmm. you just have to live with it. I mean, mm -hmm. you you want to do it, mm -hmm. you know? Like you, th there is something about 
there is something about the ongoing work of staying bound to your object mm -hmm. that 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 the pre the post phase or whatever uh, is uh, can't stop. Mm -hmm. And I think you you know you have to live with your impulse there. I don't see there's any way to undo. I don't think there's enough quotation marks in the world mm -hmm. that are going to that are that are, are going to dilute that. Mm -hmm. So the, the or a serious redaction, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, maybe, but I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think. I think once it's there, it's there. Mm -hmm. Especially because at a certain sense, you know, a preface is like you can read a preface and it's trying to put a frame around it, and then you can forget the preface and mm -hmm. read the poem. But when you're putting it in the back, you know, <laughs> you know, that's it's the first it's the first suit. And yeah. I, I don't I don't yeah. think in all of the in mm -hmm. all of the rectal you know the, I mean I think there's a reason it's in the back. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, can, we can talk about that. For a little bit. <laughs> um, now the friendly version of my Oh wow! Was, uh, was, I mean, that, you know, I mean, that was like me just saying you have to live with your mm. own contradiction. You know, you were, you were yourself said uh, I'm contradictory in relation to this, and I think you're right. And I, I just think you, I think you have to go with your own mm -hmm. anxiety. Mm -hmm. And and I would say anxiety is more operant here than shame. Yeah, sure. But so the friendly version of my question was, you know, music for porn is usually really bad. Like oh, porn I know. music is like the worst music ever. Yeah, <laughs> actually, that's not 70s porn. It's really good. Well, we could have a debate about yeah, that. Yeah, we could. I, I, we started to have that conversation, yeah, but then you moved to the other end of the I table know, a couple I had weeks to go ago. Talk to the other people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who were eating meat. Uh, uh, but um, but I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, what music for porn usually does is provide a rhythm. I mean, I'd just like you to think about. I would yeah. like you to. I think it would be fun for the group, but also, yeah. you know, um, you know, to think about fun and pleasure because yeah. it, one of the things. You you talked about this really interesting thing. You said um, uh, heroism is risk without tenderness and pleasure, or taking the bullet is. I'm not sure about that. And and um, but I think music, the mu the porn music is trying is trying to ridiculize sex in some way so that you can have it. And I just wonder how you see your mm -hmm. music for porn yeah. in relation to actual music for porn. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is funny because I mean, years ago when I first when I began reading poems from this this sequence, I would preface it again as a way to sort of perform or stage my embarrassment or my shame around the work. Um, I say, you know, it's it's funny. It's like I, I I think I was aiming. I wanted it to be the porn, right? But somehow it's like demoted. It's just like it's just the music. It's just the music for. It's like this lame accompaniment that's trying to do something that's entirely out of sync and completely. You know, there's just there's always this disjunction between that music, whether you like it or you don't, and what you're actually seeing. Um, but then I began to think about music for porn in another way that I, I like, and this was inspired by the title of Mahmoud Darwish's Memory for Forgetfulness. And that's it's something, th this idea that, that you're exchanging one for the other, right? Or one becomes the other. It just, it's, there's, there's um, the, the, the possibilities of that preposition or attribution are, are really so rich. So the title can turn in so many ways. You know. But if you want to talk about music, what kind of music you like for, <laughs> like if it's 70s porn or uh, what happens to the music from 70s porn to 80s porn, I'd love to go there too. <laughs> so. <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. L let me t let me run this by you. Tell me what you think of this, um, because I get to the end of this thing and I actually do begin like, so what the hell are you talking about? Like, what is this? What are you referring to? And I and I have this very um, expansive and uh, um, thumbnail uh, definition, if you will, of of porn as. Any regime of representation, like war, capital, or news. In fact, I used to preface the work by saying it's like when I'm thinking of porn in, the, in relation to these poems, I'm thinking of CNN. I'm thinking of Fox. I'm, you know, that's as much as I'm thinking about you know the set of connotations that come immediately to, to mind, or um, you know, or what porn seems to denote. Um, so porn, like any regime of, of representation, war, capital, news, whereby our most intimate responses to sensation and desire are mediated by technologies of the image, distillations of capital whose residues cling to my skin, right? or any apparatus of production, 
be it mil uh, media or military, whereby the most impersonal images stand in for my most personal relations, right? So that's, that's the loose framework that I'm, I'm thinking of here, right? Um, but of course you can, I mean, it goes everywhere from, from there, but um, uh, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I mean, does that, does that work as a, does that seem too feeble? Too loose, too. Um. In a way, it's it's not even a question for me of having it, it defined. I'm, I'm, I guess mm -hmm. what's interesting to me because I, that that sounds like a really great you know description of the the way that form sense of No, to the contrary, to the contrary, I mean, I really hew to this idea that, I mean, that the, that, the po that the poems are actually trying to bring the contradictory dynamics that attend that definition, that loose definition of porn to the level of, sense. I mean, through sensation to cognition, right, so that we can actually think, you know, I wasn't able to think what that was until, I mean, again, it's this back form, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back, I mean, what is it that the poems have allowed me to think? Um, and in part, I mean, it, it's wanting to find, a, wanting to, to use, wanting to find a form or a prosody that allows, allows some of these contradictions to arrive at the level of sense, as if for the first time, right? Um, so, I don't know if that's addressing your question. I mean, that's the kind of music that I'm, I'm most interested in anyway, right? <laughs> You know, whether it's prosodically or, yeah, but, and then of course the accompaniment just opens up just this, this uh, um, you know, polysemous way of, of reading the relationship between the music and the porn. And it, itself, the title is itself contradictory. I mean, it can collapse on itself or it becomes an inversion of itself. That's great. I, I, I'll, I'll think about that. I, my, my, has it, my initial thing, what I felt here in my gut when you said it's like, no. I know. But I'm thinking, why not? I don't know. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm just going to jump into the fire. Um, you know, if you, thinking about how you know, musical accompaniment in porn is, is different from any other type of, you know, um, cinematic musical accompaniment, obviously. But uh, why it's different is because it, you know, it, it is always sort of unclear what music is accompanying, whether it's accompanying your own pleasure or the pleasure you see on the screen, right? So it opens up this big question about, you know, who who is the music for, right? And um, you know, maybe maybe what is interesting is that the music is for both, um, or maybe what's interesting is that music is sort of for neither, which always happens. I mean, that's why the music is sort of this annoying. It's great. I love that this is opened on that question because honestly, it's the first time that I began a project knowing what it was going to be called. 
a long, a long time ago, and it was a throwaway, complete throwaway line, right, that just kind of came up in conversation. It, was, it was involved no thought whatsoever, and it just kind of stuck. I didn't even take it seriously at first. And now I'm being drawn back to it and asked to take it seriously. And I really appreciate that because I realize that I haven't, I, I've only begun really to, to give that title the thought that it, it deserves, perhaps. You know. What is? <laughs> Does that mean friendly or? Oh, we'll see. Um, I guess I'm interested in what's lost in this expansive definition of what porn is. You know, once you conflate all these terms and bring them all to a similar level, what kind of particularity do you not have access to? And uh, the same way, if we're saying the question would be, we understand all desire. Oh, I, I can only say, I hope the point is, yeah, I don't, um, but see, that, it's interesting that, that you said I think that's the difference because I don't think the poems are conceptualizing the problem. Poems are, are not conceptualizing the problem. If anything, and this is perhaps an, I, I, another you know, fantasy that I'm reading back into the work because I want to like it. Right, right. You know? And that is to think that at best, the poems are able to bring some of this material to the level of sensation so, you can feel, so it can be felt. And it's felt through the ear first, right? And only then. Can we begin to do? I mean, that's that's Adorno, right? It's 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 right. just it has to happen at the level of sensation, and only by virtue of that sensation, right? Then we have the raw material for conceptualization, but that comes after, and that right? Does that extinguish the sensation? Extinguish? The, the like the very act of conceptual. Once you conceptualize it, that sensation is no longer available. Or what's the? Standard? Well, it's not available in the sense that the way I I phrased it a, a few moments ago. I mean, as if for the first time, right? So there's this subjunctive mood, I think, that saturates the, you know, the, the work in, in that respect. I mean, right, so I don't know. I can't, what do you think? I mean, when, once it's conceptualized, if, if the answer to the question is in the affirmative, then the postscript risks uh, suturing something yeah. prematurely, I love, right? I guess I like the postscript. Orchestrated yeah. sensationalism of a destructive engage encounter with the body. 
It's not what a body could do, it's what a particular orchestration of the body did, does to sensationalize violence and produce uh, erotics in relation to it and to use for language. Um, you know, the, the poems are trying to unbind its own eros from within of contradictions that make them audible. That's what the poems are trying to do in ending your definition of porn, and it turned out that pleasure was mostly bad. Like I don't know. Do you, you think know? I'm valorizing it? Because all I'm saying is that you know, the, the, if you think of porn along those lines as a regime of representation that mediates my mo my most intimate relation, so my most intimate relation to myself. I'm not saying pleasure bad, pleasure good. It's just a relation. Oh, but look at the set of examples you used yeah. that you just read to us was not. Yeah, yeah. There, there was yeah. no. Uh, there was no otherwise. There was no. Uh, darkness, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't. You didn't. And I don't That's know right. about that. So. Yeah. So, yeah. In that, in that model of sensationalism, it was a sensationalism of foreclosure. Yeah. It was a sensationalism of the over-organized emotion. It was right. a sensationalism mm -hmm. of the subordinate of some sort. Mm -hmm. it wasn't just, and I think that's what you were getting at, if I understood Bob correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, what, what interested you about your own relation to the soldier you invented so that you could have an object to organize a mm -hmm. desire that was being mm -hmm. inaudible without being foreclosed mm -hmm. is that it was there was a you know there was it was only perversion you know there was no proper object in right. the poems and right. then at the end it turned out that there was an as it were improper disciplinary scene of the orchestration of pleasure so that's I think that's what Josh was saying I, and I agree that you know that and that's what I was saying before too that like you know you go for it because you want to but but the but in a way um, if right and yeah I, you I, know I. Yeah. I think I think I'm overcompensating there for you know the tendency to over valorize pleasure in the body in that regard right so just wanting and I think maybe yeah. I just am, am, am over, it's like an overkill right so you don't want to valorize just the liberatory potential of unnamed uh, um, bodily sensation or desire or pleasure or whatever pleasures might attend that. Um, but I just don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to promote that within a liberatory frame. And I think I'm just perhaps overcompensating for for that. And but it also has to do with the fundamental negativity of the state. I mean, in your relation of Whitman to Genet, Whitman, the problem of Whitman mm -hmm. is that he he attaches his desire for a, uh, the, a body that uh, a boy's body to, to a soldier, a male soldier's body. And, and moving tender about uh, about them, and I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget that. Um, where at the same time, there's something really fucked up about what Genet's doing in funeral rites when you end up with this this incredibly baroque labyrinth of fantasies that end up, you know, where the object of pleasure is is Hitler himself. I mean, it's completely, it's nuts. You know, I mean, even at the level of the writing, you just think, what? I mean, you can, Leo Bersani. Leo Bersani's got a great reading of that, right? And he's he's able to he's able to make sense of it, but it doesn't it doesn't um, doesn't correct the. <laughs> I love that because you say your whole project here at some level, even though it's not a project, because it's, you know it was it was not like polemical over the years, is, is that you can you invent the object that will sustain your desire for it. I mean, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, if it turns out to be Hitler, that's too bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> you turn the camera off. But, um, but uh, you know, but that's it. But isn't, isn't that what you, that's partly yeah, the, yeah. the thing that you're yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like yeah. a poster. No, yeah, sure. No, no, no. I, I think I saw him here. Someone, maybe. Yeah. Out, what do you mean by out or that, 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 that the poems themselves, we're finding it very difficult to talk about 
pleasure and pain and porn and you know the soldier and what the the kinds of erotic interchange between the soldier and the speaker are um, whether they're pleasurable or painful or good or bad or you know um, in a way that the postscript in some ways can, can't possibly hope to provide right, right. A, an account of right. right that's right because the the, the dramatization of that relation that you're figuring out as you write the poems right. is just it's un it's not you know so, consolidated before the writing of them and in some ways even after the writing of them that's right, right? that's um, right and so that's what I mean by the, the, the poems outrunning the postscript the sure poem, right? sure um, so that the poems are exploring questions of shame of collective shame of individual shame and, but then there's an entirely different kind right. of yeah, and, and it's almost as if the, the 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 political unconscious of the of the postscript. I mean, it, I mean, just to follow through exactly, because the poems are saturated with pleasure, right? The, I mean, it's, and I think it's almost there's this effect, you know, of a, a kind of um, preemptive cauterization, you know. Um, that's really that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, sure, absolutely. Related to each other. And then, like, one of my more, more basic points earlier was trying to get at what happens when you equate, and I know, I know you're not doing this, but if there's, there's a sense that you are a little bit, you know, you're not pretending to, equating your experience with Whitman with your experience with CNN. So these are common pleasures. Ultimately, they're the same. Once you, once you distill their essence, this is all born. And I hope I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I see, a, I see what you're... I think there's a sense I in see. which you said something about Whitman's measure or prosody mm -hmm. having become naturalized to such a degree that you can't hear what its emergence would be like or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that actually you're talking about that that's sort of related to what your aspirations for your own poem are on the level of sense, mm -hmm. an emergence of some kind that you um, aren't able to particular, particularize in advance, and that even in an afterward mm -hmm. you can't quite name. Right. 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 Because, um, and maybe you could say something right. about about that specifically about what you mean when you say sense in relation to your measures in the mm -hmm. poem, which are actually. Uh, quite uncomfortable, awkward, very leaden in the middle sejura, um, and uh, I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what you say. Yeah. Um. There's the line in the notes where you say something about how uh, prosody is the management of stress uh, that I thought was very apropos, finding it kind of a ethically neutral term stress mm -hmm. uh, to help to think about the aesthetics or, the, or poetics uh, because it seems like in some ways it's a part of organized stress. Organized yeah. Stress, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, that idea of stress can stand in in some ways as a less ethically loved term than pleasure or pain um, because it seems in a lot of ways it's a poem about stress, right? not, not just you know, formally. Or even just sense, sensation, which is the term you would use. Mm -hmm. I think that's less ethically loaded, right, than pleasure or pain, because it doesn't specify necessarily. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I mean, in terms of evaluative, right? Because I was saying ethically, but what I meant was evaluative. But anyway. Well, maybe mm -hmm. we <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. No, there's a lot. I mean, there's so much to think through. You know, and um, but you know one thing that I I that came up in my thinking at one moment during the the discussion and some of the questions is just thinking uh, and perhaps in response to, to to you in part Josh uh, just not wanting to risk um, uh, kind of an, an an ahistorical kind of collapsing of that sort but rather to uh, kind of approach this submerged um, this submerged this relationship between Whitman's 
attention to the fallen body and the kind of attention that is given that body today, right, without saying in any way that they're the same, right, but rather that there isn't, there's a, I, I'm interested in how one might tell that, how one might tell that story, right, um, and I'm not quite sure what the, the answer to that is, but it has a lot to do with this, well, what I refer to, I believe, as a kind of, this hazy eros, right, that's there, but it's not there, right, in part it's there and not there because the bodies are withdrawn, they're, they're beyond uh, our, our capacity to see, they're not even being mediated, right, in so far as there's a prohibition on, at least there was, I don't know what the state of that is now, but, um, but how that, that withdrawal, right, of this object um, facilitates promotes uh, this, this, this erotic and a submerged eros around, around the military man. And I'm also concerned about the gendering of that figure, and I'm wondering how, how that registered, right? I mean, because it's, you know, I mean, the soldier is clearly a masculine figure. And um, so that's another ongoing concern as well. I, right? did, I did have a thought about yeah, that, yeah, yeah. which was, Right. By the way, and, yeah, yeah. and but I but but it seemed like it was, that wasn't a useful thing to say. But I did have, but I thought of a useful version of that, which is if you're trying to think through. I hope it was useful anyway. It's not really for me to say. If you're trying to think through the question of how your attachment to the universal that gets stood in for by the nation gets reproduced, one of the ways it gets reproduced is the laminating of the soldier onto a male body. That is, insofar as you, so that so that. The hero, the soldier, doesn't have to be, right now, doesn't have to have a gender, because there are lots of different kinds of beings in the army and who are taking a hit for the nation. Right. Not that you can see them, but you only see them when, when you know, right now, the, the bodies of the soldiers are only mainly available uh, in the stories about hospitals that don't have enough money and, right. and, and pe the people who didn't have enough armor. And so what you see is the failure of the state in the production of the visible soldier body now. There's all sorts of things to say about that, but those mm -hmm. soldiers' bodies that have become visible by virtue of the state's failure to protect them and therefore to keep them universal right. um, are many different genders and races, and they have lots of lots of specificity and you know qualities and stuff like that. And your soldier is a kind of universal hero produced by the wound, and, and it's a and it's a male it's a male gendered universal. So the, one of the ways you could think about this, but I don't mean you could think about this in your poetry because what is the I have to like you know could he say he or she? I mean I don't even know you know. I, mean, I don't want to poetry about it, but if you were thinking, how do I start to delaminate my desire for that which is wounded on in my name, right? That is, I cannot not have a relation to, right? right? Because I am brought up as a subject, a national subject who abjures the very attachment to the world that I have, and so on. It's the kind of thing you kind of work through in the end. One of the ways to think about how that gets reproduced is that it gets it gets sexualized in your name. Right. Not in your name as citizen or in your name as person with access to the universal, but in your own. Right, right. Your and that, that interests me because it, because it actually would have been a totally different book if you said he or she. Right. The soldier she. And we'd be like, what? This is your book? You know, like we would have. Right. And that's interesting. Right. About how, again, how your object finds its body. Yeah. I thought about that, but I, I don't have a critique of that. Yeah. Another way that this worked out. Persona, so it's a soldier's body, right? But it's not a, a prisoner's, a war's body, or a terrorist's body, right? right? So you know, it's interesting because uh, in your postscript, and I think this is very true of the work, uh, that it enters into a, it dramatizes the problem just a little before it gets consolidated into right. a certain set of political concerns. Right. But one place where it does consolidate is in the choice of soldier rather than, say, Abu Ghraib prisoner, right? right. Because that would be a very different feel and feeling that I would be getting from the work if right. these same operations were happening on the body of someone with a hood, a sandbag over their head. That's right, right. Um, and 
Although those figures, yeah, those figures do um, emerge in, in the poems. So there are many. I mean, the the multi the, the the multiplication of these of these bodies exceed the what we would refer to immediately as you know U.S. military bodies, right? That they're, I mean, you know. So, um, however, right? My reflection around and this this idea of the the the. Uh, my sense of the work kind of assuming the form of this back formation of the soldier, it seemed as though that became the figure around which a set of concerns um, accreted with a particular kind of gravity um, that I wasn't attempting to, to uh, I didn't want to overburden in the process of, the con of, of, the, of writing the poems, like, whoa, why is this body as opposed to that body being privileged in these, I mean, so, so you kind of figure out through the writing of the work what particular body is the problem for you yeah, as a poet, right? Yeah, right, right. And, it, and then it became an obsession. So once it emerged with this, with a particular kind of gravity, right, then it began, it was like this, this, this repetition compulsion. And I just wanted to see how far I could, where's it, where's it going, right? Where's this taking me? And while other bodies persist in a range of ways, you know, you know dead boys in, in Gaza, um, for example, I mean that's something that came up in in the postscript as well. Um, uh, you know, it it was it was this attachment to this particular figure that then clearly was becoming an allegory um, of of sorts. Um, uh, yeah, I apologize. My ha my thinking is becoming a little hazy right now. I think I'm on the verge of a kind of exhaustion, but I'd love to. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to hear anything else. You know. I, I had a question about, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is, this is fair or not, but it, how much, uh, it, seems, it seems like there might be a type of nostalgia that's going on in terms of um, how you use the soldier, and especially in, in regards to the, you know, um, the background that you presented, mm -hmm. where, you know, reading, reading from, well, obviously historically, from Whitman through Janet, mm -hmm. You know, thinking about how war war exists presently, you yeah. know, war obviously yeah. always existing within scare quotes. Um, you know, what it do you is nostalgia? Is this like a, is this an operation that do you think is existing? Or, um, is this something which you necessarily trace? Um, you know, uh, there's a, a poem by Melville, one of one of the battle pieces, and the title now escapes me, and I'll probably misquote it, but um, it's actually the epigraph of one of the sequences that I read, but I don't have the poems here in their entirety. Um, so, but I think Melville's addressing precisely this issue where he he says something, he writes something to the effect of, "War will forever be, but warriors are now but operatives." Right. So the sequence of one of the poems I began with is actually called My Operatives, right? So I think it's, it's foregrounding that, that recognition, right? Um, I, don't know, I don't know how to think about the, nostal the nostalgia question, but certainly the, f the, the, the figure of the individual soldier as an agent of war is like not, I mean, that's not contemporary, right? If anything, I think, and I actually work through this, this idea in part in the postscript, but also elsewhere, I'm thinking about um, a concept of patiency, right? So, you know, to, to, to complement, to invert and complement a sort of overvalued or nostalgic view of agency, right? Thinking about even the soldier as a patient of history um, of sorts. Um, that's, that's a way of, of at least helping. That, that idea has helped to lubricate my thinking around that problem. But something else came to mind about nostalgia and an image of war and this recurrent, you know, repetitive, compulsive tick that that the that the poems um, exploit. And I'm reminded of uh, Bruce Connors, uh, one of his one of his film montages. Um, is it um, uh, of uh, he film loops. One of the early nuclear tests in the, one of the atolls in the South Pacific is it Bikini Beach? Are you familiar with that Bruce Connor film? 
it's fantastic and it's completely disturbing, but all it is is, I mean, it's as if, it's also something that reminds me of moments in Beckett, you know, where they're just, you know, there's a, there's a tick and the writing or the work or the, I mean, whatever the aesthetic project is, it can't get beyond that. It's trying to ingest and incorporate this, this inassimilable image or moment. I'm oh, sorry. Um, uh, and that, so those are some, those are some analogs perhaps that, that come to mind, but the Bruce Connor thing is, is kind of fascinating, right? It just can't, all it can do is, it, it arrives at that image, and it's just like, a, it's just a skip on a groove, you know, a record. So it's interesting, like, you can't lose it enough to have nostalgic work. Yeah, that's, they even yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or just really wanting to preempt, you know, recognizing, recognizing, you know, my own, help, how, how, um, uh, um, I, I incline toward a melancholy disposition, right? And so that's, that's like all about like introjecting, you know, introjecting these seemingly lost objects, right? Um, while simultaneously, just like, I mean, the, the lamination there, I mean, what's actually happening is, a, is, I like that. Can I use that? Lamination, yeah. The soldering, you know, of one's, one's sense of oneself to precisely soldering and soldiering right I mean so it's so you can't you can't you can't mourn it of course because it's you know it requires a, a letting go of oneself entirely because you've become it you know Say that again. you can't mourn the, I mean it's the opening figure in, in funeral rites where you know where Genet is at his the narrator Genet is at his lover Jean's funeral and he's got this little matchbox in his pocket Right, and he's he's so appalled by the funeral rite, right, at which his lover is being extolled, the virtues of his lover being extolled as you know you know having taken a hit for the nation, etc. And he imagines he's fondling this matchbox in his pocket, and he imagines the body of his lover entirely in this matchbox, which becomes a tomb that he then goes uh, goes on to elaborate a set of like ah. Uh, um, of, of fantasies of incorporation, right? How is he going to how is he going to actually consume that? But it begins with a matchbox in the pocket, and and this I mean he becomes the tomb of his lover essentially, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that's I don't know if that addresses your question. But that that idea that you incorporate the thing, right? That you might imagine grieving, but in fact you're creating conditions of impossibility for any kind of of, of, of mourning or grief so because you've become that the thing. Getting off on the impossibility. Sorry. On the, on the impossibility of the, you know, consummate incorporation of, 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 your, of the loss. Is that is that how you're imagining? No, maybe getting off on the impossibility of 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 letting it go. Okay. You know, the, the getting off on the getting. Yeah, that's actually a nice way of thinking. getting off on the impossibility of a kind of decathecting of that thing, right? You that you have. Not to yeah, but only if the I mean, only if that is consonant with a set of historical conditions of possibility that would allow me to do that, right? Yes, that's what I would want to do, right? But some, so it's like you're running up against that, that that wall. At least within the logic that I've that that, that the poems seem to have elaborated, right? And and you know, and I I'd, I'd like to think that that logic is in some way able to map onto or consonant with or per perceiving. Um, a historical logic. No, really. No, it's 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 been tremendous, and thank you all for your generosity and openness and. Um, it's been uh, remarkably rich and, and, and generative, so thanks.